Hi everyone. I've had the uh, incredible fortune uh, and pleasure of being able to travel to some of the world's most uh, beautiful places and I really do believe that. And I've also had the incredible luck of doing so without injury, disease, other problems, other disruptions. And I've done it all, though. I don't just stay in my hotel room and do nothing. I mean, I've taken mopeds through Vietnam, through some hairy spots uh, in forests, through mountains. I ate all the street food I could in India, and I not only survived it, but enjoyed it completely without issues, without safety issues, without injury, without medical issues, disease, and... As much as I consider that luck, um, I do also believe that luck favors the well-prepared. So, you know, from the request of so many uh, people that I work with who um, I do this for professionally for their companies, um, whether they're doing film production or some high-level type of travel, uh, I've developed this, uh, I don't know, best practices for smaller groups, for personal travel, for families, um, and, and hope that, you know, maybe some people can learn uh, from this. I learned these things through my experience traveling, um, as well as some things that uh, I found on guides here and there that uh, I already did, but didn't even consider it as a uh, worthwhile step. So I tried to highlight some things. I'm sure I left plenty of things out, but hopefully this gets the mental juices flowing um, so that you might make some good decisions for you and your group. So I try to talk about this in a very professional way in the way that I would do for work. I really believe a structured approach to risk management is a best practice for groups or families to stay safe, uh, even in your own hometown, but especially when traveling. Why? Because this includes assessing and promoting a culture that takes medical and security threats very seriously and understanding what to do. I mean, you see a threat, but then what? It's important to discuss this with everyone involved, including children or other members of your group that maybe are not as uh, well-traveled or experienced or even interested in the outing. You'll see why. And this helps everyone know their roles and responsibilities, uh, what available resources they might have in case of emergency, and so on. I really think family need a support structure that includes not only an itinerary that everybody knows and everyone is aware of, good communication avenues, a nice culture where people feel comfortable asking questions, um, especially when traveling abroad. Consider sharing your locations with each other if you have that ability on your phones, checking in frequently uh, if there's any sort of intended or unintended separation, such as somebody going to one shop while somebody goes to another shop, and always know your local emergency numbers for police and medical, okay? While it might not be necessary for, you know, family in certain super popular tourist hotspots, you know, conducting realistic simulation exercises and having flexible plan are key components of a well-structured approach to risk management. And some of that practice and training might very well be in things that you already do. So if you already share a location with uh, your children, or in my case, with my father, then when I pull up to his house and see that he's not there, um, I can pull up his location and see very clearly, oh, he's at the gym, or he's on a bike ride, or he's at a friend's house. Um, and that sort of practice makes me a lot happier when I'm abroad and I pull up his location because he's not where I expect him to be. Uh, I worry less because I know I have access to that stuff, and I'm practiced in the ability to try to um, find his location and access other resources, knowing the layout of the hotel, et cetera, et cetera. So um, 
Our health and safety experts developed this, this guide. We focused on its application to travel risk management. Uh, we discuss some of the things, um, such as the importance of identifying and assessing risks related to travel, health, safety, and we tried to provide some guidance on how you can do this for yourself to develop a really comprehensive travel risk management program. Um, especially if you are the leader of your family or group on any specific designated trip. The first component that came to mind for me is assessment. So, you know, ask yourself, do you assess the risks uh, to your group or family in your hometown and intended travel destinations, okay? You should regularly update your analysis. Uh, however you do that, uh, Google searches, looking at the weather, regularly update your analysis of health, environmental, security, natural disaster threats, um, and consider how that might be different, you know, between different locations. Uh, I come from a place that has earthquakes, for instance, if I'm traveling to a place that is also, you know, very similar to my own hometown within the United States, uh, I have to consider that they might not have earthquakes, but they might have tornadoes. And those things look and feel very differently. And the way that you respond to those things are also very different. Do you know who is responsible for risk management within your group or family? You know, you want to avoid the bystander effect um, by just assuming that somebody else has it covered, right? In many cases, this falls on the person perceived to be the most responsible or frequent traveler. But with updated information on your, I, without uh, updated information on your intended destination, this might not be enough. And, you know, the reason I put most responsible or most frequent travelers, because very often I am perceived in my groups as the most frequent traveler, but I understand that uh, my demeanor tends to be a little bit more relaxed and comfortable in any space. And so people sometimes, especially people that I know that are a little bit more anxious than me, perceive that as being a little bit too lackadaisical and, and not really... Uh, um, you know, fully appreciating uh, potential issues or threats, even though I do. Um, and so other people may bring up concerns that uh, even the most experienced travelers may not think of. After assessment, uh, which you want to encourage everyone to do because they'll develop different things, you then want to discuss have you and other family members uh, had a discussion about your own unique concerns? Um, oftentimes, as I said, the best assessors of risk are those who are not experienced travelers because they came up with things that uh, might be very valid concerns. And sure, they might come up with stuff that's, um, you know, a total non-issue. But you want to encourage them and not make them feel bad for bringing those things up uh, because they very well might hit on certain things that could be quite crucial to your planning process. These individuals may be reluctant to express their concerns unless they're given the avenue to do so, so make sure they feel comfortable in doing so. And don't let travel anxiety brew in your family or group, um, you know, by creating this culture where, you know, the most anxious and worried people have to blindly trust in others, even if, you know, those people are very trustworthy and are well-traveled, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you want everybody to feel heard. You want everybody's concerns to be addressed. And if you can do that before you leave, perfect. Does your family or group understand how risks will be managed? You want to develop clear guidelines on how travel, health, security risks are managed, showing what mitigation efforts uh, you think are necessary, and this really helps avoid panic at inappropriate times, okay? Um, you know, this goes beyond just health and security, but just regular operational risks. You know, who do we talk to if we miss a flight? Um, 
what do we do if the taxi that we planned for doesn't show up? Or, you know, does this area have a rideshare service that, uh, you know, we plan to use that works as a good backup? And is that rideshare service set up on our phones already? You know, you want to consider assessing the quality of medical care at each uh, destination, other types of accommodations, as well as access to, you know, uh, pharmacy or grocery stores or whatever is of concern to you, add it to the list, do a little bit of research. From there, we want to understand how to manage. Okay, do you understand the safety and security of your accommodations, your hotel? You know, health and safety risks of hotels and accommodations are really, really important. Okay, they should be checked ahead of planning. You should understand not only uh, the reputation of that establishment, but also try to understand the safety of the area that it is in. You don't want to feel like... Uh, you know, you're locked into your hotel from sundown to sun up. Although in some destinations, you know, this has happened to me, you know, as a best practice, trying to get home uh, before sunset. And, uh, you know, if, it, if it's an absolute necessity, understand that it's a risk. The comfort of a place uh, that becomes so familiar to you that you're in day in and day out, that you sleep in, shower in, eat in, right, may create the sense of security uh, that really is a false sense of security. And you may uh, have to be very, very conscious of that, um, you know, and in that regard, making sure that um, your sensitive items are hidden and not accessible so if somebody does have access to your uh you know your hotel accommodation or you know your house accommodation that uh you know they don't steal money passports um and other crucial items you know just try your best to uh, make sure that you're not an easy target and there are certain things you can control and certain things you can't. And so I'm not saying, um, you know, that you should try to control what you can't, but definitely plan for what you can. Review the flights uh, for your family and group, you know, to ensure minimal disruption. Um, this is where, you know, people have a lot of anxiety and this is where a lot of uh, hiccups first come about. You know, on a most uh, recent flight that I took, my first flight out of Los Angeles of all places was delayed four hours, and we sat there waiting and waiting and waiting, which caused me to miss my layover, and then when I was put on a second flight, which was thankfully the same day and not the next day, um, we were delayed due to wildfires at our destination a couple hours after that. You know, got there very, very late. Um, and if I had a service that was going to pick me up, um, you know, you have to plan so that this way you can let them know that you're going to be late um, so that this way they don't leave you high and dry, especially if you don't have, you know, other options like public transportation or ride share in that region. Or if you have so many bags that uh, you really can't use those services anyways, right? So review your layover times and consider how the amount of bags and size of the airport might affect your transitions. Uh, review your airline and flight statistics to assess the possibility of delay and what your likely next uh, flight could be if you do miss a connection, right? Look at flight records um, from the previous week and see if they've relatively been on time. And consider that groups larger than four uh, may require more time for all travel objectives because sometimes they intend to stay together. And so when one person goes through security, they wait for the other three and then they load all of their stuff together and they get in line together and they go to food together. And these types of things, um, you know, slow people down a little bit. Now, 
If you have travelers in your group with different itineraries, you want to review those separately, obviously, um, and ensure that, you know, crucial first steps, such as like getting from your home to the airport, are not botched. Uh, so many times we have that, that sense of comfort in our hometown that we think, oh, no big deal, I'll get to the airport when I get to the airport. And it isn't until you get into the car that you realize a major accident has added an hour to your commute time. And a holiday that you had no idea about has added an hour to, you know, the lines at security at the airport, right? So take care of your first steps um, so that these don't become an issue. Because if you're going to some remote locations, um, missing your first step uh, might create a massive snowball effect um, that will be headaches and you may not even get to your destination that day. You know, in the management criteria, the next thing we want to consider is assessing the fitness uh, for travel of your family and group. You know, uh, create some ideas for, you know, what would be appropriate fitness, right? And I mean this in a variety of, of ways, okay? Uh, for example, the most obvious way is individuals who are out of shape should, you know, begin some light to moderate exercise, especially before heading to a destination with a lot of walking or, you know, increased altitude, Um Areas with minimal vehicular transportation where you'll have to rely on public transportation. Places where it's hot, etc., etc., right? Individuals with health conditions should consult their physician to ensure uh, that they understand the possible increased risk, have the appropriate meds and treatments available to them, and affirm that it is safe for them to travel with their current health condition. Remember to check in with these individuals throughout the trip. Um, it's good for them to inform the group leader, um, you know, of these, you know, potential concerns before the trip. And if you are the group leader, make sure you're checking in with them regularly. Uh, make sure they feel supported. Now, how will your family and group understand and manage their existing health issues while away from home? Each uh, individual, as well as a group leader, should have guidelines to manage chronic and acute health conditions, taking into account the destinations, as they may be different. Health risks in those places. Health risks unique to each individual and the standard of care. Understand how these might affect existing health issues and if you are a group leader in the sense that uh, you are the head of your household um, or you are just generally in charge of these types of activities, I strongly, strongly encourage you to take a first aid and CPR course and familiarize yourself with some emergency procedures. Um, super handy. Can't state that enough. And so now we move in towards the end. Uh, we talk about education. Does everyone in the family gr or group understand the destination specific risks? Set time aside to discuss travel in this way. Uh, oftentimes, one or two group leaders um, will discuss the entire means of the trip and everyone else just goes along. And while that's certainly nice and works well for some people, I encourage everyone to uh, get together so that everyone has a very nice, clear-cut understanding of what's going on on what day. Not only the logistics, but the risks as well. <laughs> and so I like to do that with uh, shared notes. Um, if everybody's on, you know, an iPhone, shared notes work incredibly, incredibly well so that you can update itineraries and update plans and activities from day to day, et cetera, et cetera. You know, from there we wanna see, does everyone in your family or group understand how, how personal grooming and hygiene might be different in your destination? Uh, this is a huge, huge, huge one. Don't let your family or group be surprised by the lack of things like toilet paper or a standing toilet or the lack of privacy in a bathroom, right? 
Um, and these are basic things, but, uh, you know, understand these ahead of time and prepare with, you know, comfort items that you might need, such as toilet paper, hand wipes, and more, right? And don't forget to uh, brush your teeth regularly, too. Um, you definitely want to avoid, uh, you know, a dental emergency while abroad. And you may not need to, like, you know, stock up on these things before you leave, although I do like traveling with at least, uh, you know, some backups, some wipes, just in case. Um, but, you know, prioritize getting those when you land. And in other countries, you know, or in certain countries, you might also want to stock up on other necessities, uh, such as, you know, a case of water in countries where you shouldn't really be drinking, uh, you know, the, the local water, right? The tap water. Stuff like that. Always be creative and be uh, forwardly thinking in that regard. Now we move on to monitoring, all right? Do you have a tool in place which can locate your family or group? Um, create a list with the current number of individuals on the trips. Make sure you have their names, their ages, where they're staying, what they look like, in an easy accessible format, a note card or something that can be referenced in case you need the help of authorities to locate someone. Now, within your own family, sure. You know what your children look like, you know what your spouse looks like, you know their age, you know their birthday, you know their name. But if you're traveling in a group, um, you know, that might have friends and their spouses, you know, knowing their last name, their age, um, and even having a picture of them in the case you get separated can be extremely, extremely helpful. Okay. And in the same regard, do you have a system in place to quickly account for your family in case of an emergency, right? Be informed of the intended destinations, especially when people decide to split up, even if it's in the same general area, like a open air market or something. Individuals should also have contact numbers of other members, even if the entire trip was planned by one, two or three people and everyone is connected some way to those people. Um, everyone else should have each other's numbers saved in their phones or written down somewhere. The address of the hotel is also helpful. Um, and everyone should have some money to cover transportation back to the hotel, right? Or other types of accommodation. You know, I've been on trips where, you know, there is only one person that really, uh, has a credit card that doesn't have any foreign transaction fees or that works rather, um, or has is only one person that has local currency. And, you know, that works, especially if people aren't going to split up. But if there's a chance that people will split up, you want to cover some basics. And so now we come down to personal responsibility. And most people would include that first, but I include it at the end. Um... I think it makes more sense here because now we're going to cover things that could be covered as a group but uh, should absolutely be covered by the individual. Does your family or group know where they might be able to access advice and support before and during the trip? Okay? Now, while the overwhelming amount of planning and research from risk management may be handled by one person only, each individual should understand that they could do their own Google search and understand basic health and safety advice online. Cannot encourage that enough. Everyone should do some own, their own research, bring interesting topics to discussion uh, when the entire group gets together, right? Does your group have a plan to ensure the mental well-being of the family and group? Now, even short domestic travel right, can create a normal amount of baseline anxiety. So consider how the uniqueness of your planned trip, the complexity of your travel, the nature of your destination, etc., etc., may impact your family or group. 
Consider how pre-existing mental health conditions might be exacerbated by these differences and uncertainties. And you really want to encourage all individuals to take care of their mental health and check in with their healthcare providers as needed. With the growing popularity of online therapeutic and psychological care, uh, you may have a lot more resources than um, travelers did previously, and this can be quite useful. So lastly, do you have a system in place to ensure crucial items are not left behind? Okay, ensure crucial items are not left behind by creating checklists that do not disappear when items are checked. If you write down a list, just check it off. Don't scratch it out entirely. If you're using an electronic list, make sure that the item doesn't disappear once the box is checked. And this practice allows you to go through your checklist for a last minute double check of items you are pretty sure you've already packed, but oftentimes you might be surprised by certain items that were missed because uh, you were interrupted in the process of packing them. And you can remind everyone in the family to pack important things, personal items, such as medications, toiletries, etc. Consider doing one final check before the point of no return. You know, that point where you leave your home and get into a ride share to head to the airport, right? That point. To ensure that you have things like your cell phone, wallet, glasses, contacts, passport, stuff like that. Just take a moment. Take a deep breath. After you put your luggage in the trunk, before you sit down and drive away, Check your pockets, wallet, phone, glasses, passport. I am going to the correct airport. I know what time my flight is. I know which terminal I'm going to. Anything that comes to mind, consider it and double check it. And that's basically it. You know, we really hope you enjoyed uh, this brief overview of risk management, although it wasn't so brief. But we do this in, you know, incredibly larger complication for, uh, you know, big groups, companies, and et cetera. And we hope this gives you an idea uh, of some good ideas, an idea of some good ideas to improve your safety and security and health at home um, and abroad. You know, I truly believe that you must understand your threats before you can manage them. And in planning you very likely avoid these major issues or disruptions on your trip altogether. And with that, safe travels.